All right, as uh, everyone is uh, taking your seats, just before we start our second panel of the day here on intelligence, uh, I think many of you know I'm Will Inboden. I'm the executive director of the Clements Center and also a professor at the LBJ School and in the history department. And uh, a very toxic and dangerous combination is a professor, a microphone, and a captive audience. And that's what I have you here. So um, anyway, I'm told I'm not allowed to do a 60-minute lecture on some obscure historical topic. But I do want to take advantage uh, uh, of having this great group here, all united of all different you know, walks of life and backgrounds and ages and uh, so forth, but all united by a common interest in uh, national security policy to uh, tell you about a exciting new initiative that uh, Chancellor McRaven has launched in which uh, I'm uh, Bobby Chesney and Paul Miller and I and a number of others are honored to be a part of and that's a new journal the Texas National Security Review now uh, if you're like me the first time you hear about a new journal you think oh boy do we really need yet another journal uh, I can barely keep up with uh, I certainly can't even keep up with all the reading I have now nor can nor can certainly my students uh, but our reason for doing this new journal is we we as we you know, did our market assessment and uh, taking a look at, you know, the, the, the current panoply of existing publications, we did realize that there were a couple of gaps that we wanted to fill. Part of it, of course, is the theme of bringing a distinctive Texas voice to national security and international security issues. Uh, uh, to many of you may have heard that Chancellor McRaven's tagline for what we're doing with the National Security Network is, what does Texas think on these issues? And uh, in addition to doing conferences and uh, events like this one, uh, we also want to uh, have, have a print voice. Um, but we hope that the new journal will, will address two existing gaps. Uh, one is is what is still a gap, honestly, a chasm between academic research and the, the needs uh, and interest of, of policymakers. We've got great scholars across the country, across the world, working on interesting issues, and we've got you know, very, uh, you know, very capable policymakers and military leaders and intelligence professionals working on a lot of the same issues, but the conversations are very, very limited, very stilted if they take place at all. And so with this journal, we're going to be having, you know, about half the articles will be by scholars, and the other half will be by policymakers, and so we're literally going to be putting them in conversation with, uh, with each other. The scholarly side will be peer-reviewed. Uh, so for all you PhD students and untenured professors out there, it's going to be great for your CV, we hope, uh, so for, for getting jobs and promotions. Um, and then the policy articles will go through a, uh, a, a, not, not, a not a peer review, but a rigorous selection process as well. Um, but the second is the gap between online and print. Uh, you know, as the online world has proliferated, it brings many advantages of flexibility, a rapid pace. Uh, but sometimes online can be a little, little facile. Uh, uh, can lack some of the depth and reflection and just a sort of enduring existence of print. And so we've already launched the online edition of the journal in partnership with the war site War on the Rocks. Uh, and so I hope all of you already read War on the Rocks. If not, please uh, start reading it. Really one of the most uh, compelling and innovative uh, defense and foreign policy websites out there. Now a important partner uh, and the online portal for the Texas National Security Review. And then the print edition of our quarterly journal, the first one will be appearing next month in, in November. And so we hope all of you will uh, We'll keep an eager eye, eager eye out for that, and we'll be trying to put a lot of the print, uh, print uh, articles on, on, online as well. Um, so uh, with you know, a little bit of, uh, I suppose, Texas audacity, we, uh, we hope that our new journal will be an important and welcome voice to the conversation, which already is a, is a crowded one, but there's always uh, room, we hope, for good ideas, good thinking, clear, clear writing. So stay tuned for that. All right, now I'm going to turn over to uh, Fred Burton, our good, uh, good friend with Stratfor, who's going to introduce our next panel on intelligence. So please join me in welcoming them. So. Thank you, Will. Uh, first, I would like to thank the uh, Clements and Strauss uh, Center uh, for uh, allowing us to help uh, sponsor this event this year. Uh, it truly is an honor. Uh, and um, again, I'm Fred Burton, and as by way of background, I'm a former State Department Special Agent, and I would be remiss for not recognizing uh, Admiral Bobby Inman, because uh, without Admiral Inman, uh, I would not have had a job uh, after the Beirut Embassy bombings when uh, the Inman panel met and uh, decided to hire hundreds of State Department special agents. So thank you, Admiral Inman. But I must say, on many occasions, I don't know if I uh, wished I had probably should have stayed in my police car instead of uh, uh, being sent to Pakistan, for example. <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce... Uh, my distinguished panel, I feel uh, very humbled to be on the same stage uh, with this group. Um, uh, first, uh, Leslie Ireland. Uh, Leslie is the former Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Intelligence and Analysis. Uh, we have uh, Marcel Latre, 
who's the former Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. Marcel's at the end. Uh, we have John McLaughlin, who is the former Acting Director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And we have Mr. David Shedd, who is the former Acting Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. And uh, Director McLaughlin was kind enough to uh, volunteer to lead off with remarks first. So uh, at this time, uh, sir, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Fred. And it's great to be on this panel with uh, former colleagues and great to look out at this wonderful audience of students, faculty, and, uh, and the public. So thank you all for being here. Uh, this is a very uh, arcane subject, I think. And many of you may be wondering, do intelligence relations really exist? I mean, are there relationships among intelligence services? It's not like military. It's not like diplomacy. So I, I think my job as the first uh, speaker is to kind of frame this a little bit for, the, for you and for the panel, and, and then have my fellow panelists dive into some of the details uh, that go along with that framing. I guess thinking about this uh, on the way down here, it occurred to me what a rich subject this is. The breadth and depth of it is striking. Um, and I was going to walk through some of my personal experiences. I'll mention them later. But what came to me as I thought about this was the inevitability of these relationships, if you think about it, uh, very much keyed to events in the world. The Soviet Union collapses. All of a sudden, you have 15 new countries. You have the Soviet satellites of Eastern Europe suddenly freed from that yoke. They all want intelligence services. They are all, in some cases, transforming from what they were to what they want to be, services in open, free societies. Uh, inevitably, the United States wants to affect that process. Uh, we want to move them in the direction that is compatible with our interests. So inevitably, you have those relationships to work on. Or you're in a conflict like Iraq or Afghanistan. Take Iraq, for example. We found ourselves all of a sudden combating an insurgency in a country where the intelligence service, by inevitability, had been abolished. And so we found ourselves combating an, intelligent, uh, an insurgency without a local partner. And we had to then assist in creating an intelligence service. So there's a certain inevitability to engagement with the intelligence world by the United States overseas. Now I'm going to talk about four things. I'm going to talk about why these relationships are more important today than ever. Let me just spend a minute on that before moving on. I think in the previous panel, we got an insight into why these relationships are more important than ever. Essentially, I think the point is the world has changed. Uh, we are no longer in a bipolar world. We are no longer in a world that was once described as the unipolar moment when the United States could do more or less what it wanted. We have a world of rising powers, a world of competitive uh, power developing. And as someone said in the previous panel, in a way that sort of summarizes this, uh, nothing important in the world can be done without the United States, but nothing important in the world can be done by the United States alone. And the relationships between intelligence services and among them is an important component of alliance management uh, by the United States when you're trying to achieve something overseas. All of the problems that the United States is dealing with today, think of them for a moment. Terrorism, proliferation, uh, nuclear matters, cyber, every one of them crosses national boundaries, crosses continents, crosses disciplines. And we don't own all of the expertise on all of those issues as intelligence officers. Um, so there's an inevitability to this. And these relationships are today more important than they were when I began my career and we had essentially one major, major target on which we concentrated about 60% of our effort. A much more diverse world. Second thing I would talk about is, what do these relationships actually do for you? Well, uh, let me walk through five different categories of things and give you an example. They provide you data. 
They provide you analysis. They provide you information that otherwise you might not have. Um, for example, uh, when there was a threat of a, a cartridge, a printer cartridge being uh, used to blow up an airplane, if I'm to believe the press, and I have no reason to doubt it, uh, that information came to us, the warning on that came to us from another intelligence service, the Saudis. So we gained data. Uh, you learn things about the world through these relationships that you otherwise might not know. A second thing is these relationships give you access. Uh, access uh, to territory, for example. Um, Fifteen days after 9-11, at the uh, charge of the president, we had to have teams on the ground in Afghanistan to begin the fight against the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda. And we were there 15 days later. How much harder it would have been had we not invested in an intelligence relationship with Uzbekistan, which happens to border Afghanistan, and which provided an ideal jumping off point for the insertion of those teams. So these relationships can provide you access, not just to territory. Uh, you know, I often think uh, in this realm about a time when I was in my office uh, receiving an intelligence uh, delegation from another country. This was a small uh, country in Asia that in the larger scheme of things geopolitically is not that important. And they were rather awestruck to be at the CIA. And they said to me, I remember these words vividly, they said, you're so big and we are so small. And I said to them, no, where you are, you're so big and we're so small. Because they would have access to what's going on on the street, to understanding the culture, to being able to predict relationships that we would have no sense of. Some of this was discussed in the earlier panel. Third, these relationships give you the opportunity to collaborate on operational issues. For example, you went back to the first Gulf War, 1990. A group of CIA officers were stranded in Kuwait when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Remember that episode? How to get them out? To the rescue, the Polish intelligence service, which at that time was transforming from a service that had existed in a communist country to one that was existing in a new Poland. Uh, they had construction projects in Poland or in uh, Iraq. They disguised our officers as construction workers, uh, sprinkled enough vodka on them that they could <laughs> appear to be drunk and therefore have a reason for not speaking Polish, <laughs> and, and drove them out of the country. And uh, along with the director, uh, I and the director personally gave them a medal for that, for that work. Um, after 9-11, Essentially, the CIA took down the 9-11 era leadership of Al-Qaeda, uh, capturing the top leadership. We could not have done that without the collaboration of many services, including uh, the Pakistani service. In that era, we used to say frequently the Pakistanis were probably our best counterterrorism allies. Things have gotten rocky and gone back and forth since then, but fundamentally, that's an important chapter in the history. Um, lots of examples of operational collaboration. Fourth, uh, these relationships allow you, on behalf of the United States, to deliver messages uh, securely and also sometimes to keep um, lines of contact and communication alive when political tensions rise between countries. Uh, during the Iraq War, there were many European countries that strongly objected to U.S. policy and the diplomatic relationship was very rocky, very cool. But I can tell you, without walking through specific examples, that on the intelligence level, we managed to keep those relationships strong and functioning. And that was a sort of web, webbing, if you will, that kept the United States connected uh, to its allies in an important way. And sometimes these relationships give you the opportunity to be kind of the honest broker uh, between competing uh, groups and countries. Uh, I could mention a, an example in the late 90s when the CIA performed that honest broker relationship between the Palestinian security services and the Israeli security services because both sides saw uh, us as objective and neutral. 
very important to do that. Third, I just want so those that's point two. Third point, and then I'm going to quickly wrap up. Third point is, it's possible I think to kind of divide the relationships we have into some categories, and this is hard and controversial. So anyone in the audience will be thinking as I say these things, oh, I would disagree. But here's how I do it, and and this changes a lot. First category is relationships that are generally friendly. And you heard about some of them in the previous panel. Obviously, our allies, probably at the top of the heap, the Commonwealth countries, uh, Australia, New Zealand, <coughs> Canada, uh, the UK. With them, we have a relationship that is so close, I would say it's in the burden sharing category. We literally assign each other things to do. And we have an agreement not to operate against each other. That's sort of the premier set of relationships. But relationships with NATO countries, as Ambassador Lute was talking about, EU countries, countries that we are close to, allies, Japan, South Korea, and so forth, very close. Second category, I would say, is countries that are neither adversary nor ally. You have relationships with them, too. And it's harder to name them, because someone will get offended. But uh, countries that are neither, in neither of those categories, Maybe Algeria might fit that mold. Some of the Central Asian countries. Not, not formal allies, not adversaries, but essential relationships to understand their local circumstances and the, the environment in which they live. And a final category is, uh, again, hard to name, but I, I call it uh, cases where your interests override the tensions. Okay. What could be more tense than our relationship with Russia? But how are you going to deal with Syria if you don't have a relationship with Russia? How could you have gotten the Iran nuclear agreement without a relationship with Russia uh, on those issues? Um, Iran. Iran was quite helpful, despite all the tensions, if you went back to the post-Afghan uh, war period in the 2001, they were quite helpful in the conference that structured a new Afghanistan after initial phase of the war. Uh, China, of course, lots of tensions, South China Sea, East China Sea, but on North Korea, we're going to have to deal with them, and we have to have a cooperative relationship. So those are some categories to think about. Final point I'd make, and then I'm, I'm going to stop, is just to say that, as in all intelligence matters, there's a certain amount of cognitive dissonance you have to deal with here. This is espionage. It's not diplomacy. So that means that while you're developing these relationships, you also have to think about defense. Because other intelligence services often seek to penetrate ours. Of course, we would never do that to them. <laughs> but that is a reality of these relationships. So if you're not able to hold those two ideas in your mind without uh, you know, losing your balance, uh, this is not for you. But that, you have to hold those two ideas in your mind at all times, that you have an offense and you have a defense that you're playing all the time. So these are complicated relationships, but I'll close there just by saying what I said at the very beginning. They are inevitable, and they are more important today than they ever have been in our history uh, as an intelligence country. Thank you. John. David? Uh, thank you for this venue uh, today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to speak to the young people in particular in the room, and that's anybody under the age of 85. <laughs> uh, it, it warms my heart, though, to see the students here in particular with this, uh, this passion for uh, eventually leading our country in some form or another, whether it's in the intelligence field or more broadly in national security. Building on what John said, and frankly building on the first panel, uh, I thought I would do an acrostic that you might be able to take away that uh, sums up many of the points that John was saying in the previous panel that to me were essential during my 33 years of service in, in the intelligence business that crossed over from CIA into the Defense Intelligence Agency to where it was defense intelligence as well, but was held in common. So in thinking about an acrostic, I thought, of maybe using the University of Texas at Austin, but I couldn't come up with enough things to go with every letter. <laughs> so I will spare both the panel and the audience uh, an acrostic anywhere nearly that long to, to uh, really the word trust. 
that is really the thematic that I believe uh, is, is essential throughout every aspect of these relationships, notwithstanding the complexities of a post-Cold World uh, War world. Uh, the peace dividend era, as it was, it was named by some in the 1990s, and the world that we live in today that arguably is, is fraught with complexities uh, beyond our, our possible imagination. So on the trust side, the T for a, a degree of transparency is absolutely necessary in these relationships. That is, building with that partner relationship or vice versa, that partner working with us as Americans, a, a modicum of transparency on what the objectives are. That is being clear that uh, our interests are aligned and transparent when those interests do not align, established either by their political or policy uh, establishment or on our side as well. And John spoke to that in his latter part of the comments of the tiered process of looking of those. As I was taught in my early days, there is no friendly liaison, liaison being this partner relationship in terms of their self-interest. There's just overlapping interests. On those, you need to be perfectly transparent in terms of your pursuits. The R in trust is mutual respect. So it's the respect that you have for one another. I really enjoyed your example of the small Asia country that's coming into CIA headquarters at Langley, and they say, you're so big, we're so small. Well, in their territory, they're so big, and we're really probably inconspicuous in, in that location. And so that's about respect for each other, the respect for each other's capabilities, the respect for the limits that their own political establishment has placed on them in terms how far they would go. This has been accentuated in a world, and I'm sorry, I still go back to an old phrase, the war on terror. Just how far that partner relationship might go in terms of executing their roles in what they share with you as it's associated with the far end of the spectrum of kinetic action, for example. That to me is of having respect. It's not of one of criticism toward the other. And closely tied to that then is you in the trust, which is the use of intelligence. I think at times or information that is shared, the boundaries of that have to be very well established. In the code of conduct of their service and the con code of conduct by our service, as to what limitations and how broadly that information can be used for purposes that in fact may not be shared with that partner in terms of the application of that information. What the president might do to it once it's incorporated into analysis. That has to be clear to our partners as well. S, one of my favorite ones, secrecy. One of the greatest things to undermine the confidence of a partner are leaks. It's the misuse of their information. Reading it in, and I won't name periodicals, but I think you can guess which ones, and seeing their information out there, or inadvertently or with forethought, shared when in fact it was not approved to be shared with another party. That may have occurred in recent times in terms of how the press covered it. And that is deleterious to the relationship beyond words. Mm -hmm. It takes time and it takes effort and the fragility of that information and the sources behind it are put at risk. And that undermines trust, so S for secrecy. And the final T is targeting. I use this word in the broadest sense of the word. That is, and I think John, you said it well, it's, what do they do well by way of the opportunity cost that if we were trying to replicate it, we would do so at either a very high expense or not really even having the talent, let alone the, the, the locational geography and all the rest. That is, 
identifying those requirements that we need in these partnerships and then really targeting in to what that partner can provide and on our side, on the American side, being able to identify what in fact the Americans need from that partner relationship. As they, as they well say, uh, the gap between that, that expectation and the deliverable is disappointment, right? That's called the gap. That's what you have to close constantly with these partners in terms of the relationships. You have to understand, understand what their means are and ultimately what their ends are for this relationship of, of trust building. I look forward to your questions and comments as well, and I will uh, pass it back to you, Fred. But uh, take away trust as being the centerpiece. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Leslie? Sure. Um, I, I'm going to reiterate here. I'm thankful to be here. It's my second time at UT Austin. Um, tremendous hospitality and a tremendously curious audience that comes always with great questions, so I appreciate um, the chance to speak with you. And I want to take it, this conversation in a slightly different direction, maybe um, drive down a little bit more in a specific area where I think that liaison relationships are going to be critical. I think they're critical now, they'll be increasingly critical in the future, and that's the area of cybersecurity. Um, cybersecurity knows no bounds. There are no international uh, boundaries, there are no lines, uh, and it's a shared challenge that we face. And I want to start with a story that gives you an example of how threat actors are constantly trying to penetrate networks. So in November of 2009, I'm traveling with the White House and I'm over in China, in Shanghai. I uh, got into the hotel at about 12.30 at night, which is uh, an intelligence briefer. That's about when I started my job. Everybody else went off to go to sleep. And um, I decided I was going to go to the gym, uh, work out before I started preparing my briefing. So I'm in the gym, and no less than seven um, security officers uh, poked their heads in to see what I was doing. Well, part of what I was showing them was that I um, was working out. I was also showing them that I wasn't in my hotel room. I uh, finished my workout, got ready, changed, prepared the briefing, delivered it, came back to my room, and um, noticed that my running shoes were not where my running shoes had been. They were placed very carefully on top of each other, and the shoelaces were laid out very artfully. And this was a signal. Um, We've been in your room. So what were they looking for, and what didn't they find, because I'm a good intelligence officer? They were looking for any information about me, my passport, my wallet. They were looking for any electronics. They wanted my Blackberry. They wanted my iPod. They wanted anything with a Bluetooth device in it. And I had, before I went to the gym, I had taken all of those things, and I had very carefully placed them in the room that the White House always sets up when the president travels for secure information. The point is, there are actors out there, they're always looking for ways to penetrate a network. And in this case, this was a perhaps a liaison relationship, but it was the other side of a liaison relationship. Mm -hmm. And you always have to worry about counterintelligence. But where I want to take this on cybersecurity is where I think is an area that is vital to each and every person in this room, which is cybersecurity and the financial sector. The health and resiliency of the financial sector is a matter of national security. If there's anything I want you to walk away with from my talk today, is that is something that we need to worry about as a country. Four and a half trillion dollars move through a handful of banks in New York City on a daily basis. Four and a half trillion dollars, that's roughly 25% of our gross domestic product on a daily basis. And you may look at that and think, or hear me say that and think, but, but wait a minute, how many checking accounts is that? How many savings accounts is that? What you're not aware of is in the financial sector, a lot of what they're doing, yes, handling your money, but they're also handling very significant functions. They're processing payroll. They're settling trades on the stock market on a daily basis. They're settling the U.S. securities auction. Imagine if the U.S. ability to sell its debt is interrupted. 
this is a matter of national security in terms of protecting the financial sector. And what I want to come back to at the end of this is this is an area where I think we really need to be working closely with liaison. Because in many instances, the actors that are doing these things are not in the United States, but they're overseas. So you need to understand about the financial sector is that it functions based on trust and confidence. You, on a daily basis, you aren't aware of it, but you ask yourself several questions. You think, is my money safe? Can I get at it when I need to? And can I move it when I have to? Cyber attacks can threaten that trust and confidence because they can interrupt your ability to do any of those things. Now let me give you some examples of how the financial sector has come under attack. Last February, the Bank of Bangladesh uh, lost $81 million. Uh, and this was by a cyber actor, which if I understand, uh, read the newspaper correctly, was North Korea, a state actor was actually gunning for a billion dollars to steal from the central bank of Bangladesh. And it appears they did this by obtaining credentials and fraudulently logging into a, an account, a SWIFT account, and representing themselves as part of the Bangladesh central bank. You had cases in um, Thailand. Uh, cyber criminals have figured out how to remotely access ATMs and get them to spit out money. You don't even have to be there with your ATM card anymore. They can arrange to have somebody standing at the ATM and, and they can trigger remotely. Um, there are disruptive and destructive attacks. Back in 2013, banks in South Korea came under attack and 40,000 40, computers were bricked. That means those computers were no longer usable and their, their uh, clients couldn't get into their accounts and they couldn't get into ATMs. Um, in 2011 to 2013, the U.S. financial sector came under distributed denial of service attacks. Some of you probably experienced that if you had difficulty getting into your account or logging onto your web page. And there are also issues of insider threat. Uh, we know that on the dark web there are criminal actors who either claim to have somebody on the inside of a bank who is willing to pass on credentials or they are looking for people inside banks who are willing to sell that kind of information to steal money from accounts. And I will just say finally, because I think this is an uh, excellent example of where international collaboration is critical, last December, the US working with European law enforcement took down a network that they called Operation Avalanche. And they called it Avalanche just because of the sheer magnitude of what these actors were doing. They were based out of Eastern Europe, and they were largely running against the financial sector. They were installing banking trojans. Banking trojan is when they are able to replicate a web page. You think you're logging into your bank account. You're not. You're giving them your login ID. You're giving them your password. They can take that information, and they can then drain funds from your account. They were providing as a service ransomware. If you didn't know how to develop it yourself, you could go buy it from them. And they were also operating a team of what are called money mules. So when they got money, they had to launder it. They had to figure out a way to clean it up before they could use it. This took four years to take this down. And it was only done through collaborative effort. And I'm confident that network is trying to build itself back up again, if it hasn't done so already. So this really is a global problem. Um, in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, there were a number of financial institutions that were identified as globally, systemically important banks, or GSIBs. There are eight of them that are in the United States, the other 22 are overseas, in Europe, and in Asia. And these are the banks that you have to worry about, realistically, having a very negative, if not chaotic, impact on um, our economies and um, order if they are come under a significant cyber attack. And I think the role that intelligence plays, and this is where in listening to Ambassador Lute talk about there's so much out there that's publicly available. Fact is, I think the intelligence communities of the world can bring a very unique perspective on cybersecurity. I think financial institutions are very well aware of the attack vectors that are being used. They're watching their own networks, they understand um, the IP addresses, they know what 
they know what to be looking for in the moment. But I think intelligence brings an understanding about the intentions of organizations. You, you can't get that with an iPhone camera. They um, understand about broader capabilities. Um, they understand about trends in activity. And I think this is an area that, that collaboration between intelligence services will be very important as we're trying to understand how to tackle this program, problem, frankly, that is a global threat. Thank you very much, Leslie. Marcel. Uh, so I also want to thank uh, the community here for giving us a chance to um, flee Washington and, and come here uh, for a day. And, and all of you taking your time to engage in these issues is really wonderful. Um, particularly for me, I have a 15-year-old daughter who, at age 10, in fifth grade, I don't know if it works this way here, but in the D.C. area, in fifth grade, you study a state. You get to pick a state that's your favorite state. And she kind of randomly picked Texas as her favorite state. And uh, it's stuck with her ever since. So every time I get to come here and pick up a couple fresh U t-shirts and some Keep Austin Weird t-shirts and bring them back for her, she's thrilled about it. And uh, maybe even we'll see her getting, uh, getting out here for college as she starts that path in the next couple of years. But, um, one of the things I think I'd do for this panel is to tie the intelligence partnering panel uh, back into the military uh, and defense panel from earlier. Uh, when I was in government, I was at the Pentagon uh, for the last eight years until January and uh, served in my last assignment as the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, which has to think about, on behalf of the intelligence community, um, how intelligence gets best served up to support the military and the warfighter. And I was really struck by, uh, bottom line, how much of my time and, and how big a priority it was for me and my team to think about the role of partners and alliances intelligence, defense intelligence partnerships, um, and the intelligence aspects of our alliances, and how big a deal that was um, to defense intelligence for uh, moving operations forward. Um, it's in part because, as the previous panel mentioned, um, our warfighters, our military, really insist on going into military operations today with partners, friends, and allies in everything we do. Um, if you take the counter-ISIS coalition, for example, um, I think uh, Ambassador Lute mentioned that that coalition consists of about 60-plus members at this point, not all of whom are fighting operationally, but many of whom are. And you also think about NATO and the um, reliance we have on our NATO partners uh, to think about how to deter Russian aggression, or our South Korean and Japanese allies when we think about China operating in the South China Seas, um, or the North Korea problem set with its uh, pursuit of intercontinental ballistic missiles armed with nuclear warheads. Um, so allies are important to our military in a context when, in an unprecedented way, intelligence drives our military operations. If you think about the counter-ISIS campaign or any, any counter-terrorism operation that the military was involved in over the last 16 years since 9-11, um, intelligence was really the secret sauce that made those military operations effective. And we've come to rely on precision strike in counterterrorism military operations um, as the preeminent tool of putting pressure on terrorist networks. But we also rely on that precision capability in all of the other contingencies that, that our military has to plan for. Um, just to give an anecdote, uh, when I was, uh, was in the Pentagon, I had a chance to you know, engage pretty regularly um, from the Pentagon in thinking through our counter-ISIS campaign, and twice had a chance to travel with our special operations leadership um, into Syria uh, in the early stages of our efforts to move against ISIS um, in Syria after having started to stabilize the situation in Iraq while also putting pressure on nodes in, in Libya and other places. And we flew in in the middle of the night in Ospreys, to land in a small desert facility where our special operators were working on the ground in conjunction with uh, Syrian Kurds and Syrian Arab co coalition partners there who we had cobbled together as an action element on the ground. And as you all know, over time, we've been putting pressure on ISIS bit by bit, stage by stage, town by town, and city by city, with a lot of focus uh, culminating most recently in an effort to dislodge 
uh, ISIS from its so-called ca capital in, in the, ca the city of Raqqa. What I was struck by as I got a chance to really see our operators in action was a recognition that the ability to, to put pressure on these terrorist networks and take out individual terrorist leaders who were, who were driving this destabilization in that region depended on an amazing intelligence network that extended back to the US and information accumulated by the CIA and in some cases the FBI. And it extended to our uh, close allied partners, information gleaned from law enforcement operations in London against nodes in the United Kingdom or in France against actors who were plotting against Paris or Germany or Italy and so forth. That information flowed across a network that was intelligence and law enforcement networks fundamentally into our military operations, allowing us to deliver these precise military effects that would eventually, I think successfully, root out ISIS from both Iraq and Syria. The same thing can apply if you think about um, the challenge of deterring Russian aggression or deterring China from nefarious activities in the South China Seas or North Korea and its ballistic missile uh, capabilities. Intelligence feeds all of the planning that our military does, and if need be, if we have to act, will feed that precision kinetic capability and those precision operations that we, uh, we know are essential to our military operational posture going forward. So our military fights with allies and partners. Our military relies on intelligence to drive its military operations. And therefore, we have to do a lot of hard thinking about how we can make sure that our partners and allies uh, can sit shoulder to shoulder with our uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines and deliver those operational effects with the, the access to intelligence that's necessary. So that quickly actually becomes a fairly complicated problem set. As um, Leslie, John, and David have mentioned in their presentations, um, you immediately get into complicated questions of sharing information, what to share, when to share, why to share. Some of our most exquisite intelligence sources are at the top secret or higher level. Our military operates at kind of a uh, more uh, run-of-the-mill level, the secret or, or confidential level, which allows less highly classified information to be shared more widely. But some of these military operations, particularly counterterrorism operations, require access to that exquisite information. So how do you pull, pull together a, an approach that allows our allies to operate effectively? In addition, um, we're pretty big, as has been mentioned repeatedly. Just to, if you think about the US intelligence community, it's 17 different organizations. Eight of those defense intelligence organizations, uh, eight of those organizations in the US intelligence community are defense intelligence organizations, plus um, functional and regional four-star commanders who run combatant commands across the globe. Um, the military services have specialized technical intelligence analytics centers. When you add all this up, everyone is eager to lean forward and partner and share, but it becomes a very complex organism across defense intelligence. So this combination of the operational need to partner, the imperative to use intelligence to drive operations, the challenges of um, sharing information in this complex environment, and the complexity of all these organizations involved ends up driving us ultimately in the defense intelligence context towards a whole architecture and a system of systems for dealing with our intelligence partnerships. Some of these have been mentioned already. Uh, our Commonwealth partners, the so-called Five Eyes, the UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, are one example of a, of a cluster of close allies that we are able to build a very close operational collaboration with. In fact, in many cases, we sit in the same facilities, um, having access to the same computer systems and the same data feeds. With other allies um, who are uh, operating in incredibly powerful ways, to take the French, for example, are sharing, who, who are very valuable as partners in going after ISIS, particularly in North Africa, <coughs> our sharing um, history has been different um, over the decades. And we've had to spend some time over the last two to three years to build a, uh, an architecture for doing that, which we moved substantially forward after the 
French suffered a big attack in Paris in November of 2015. And um, our political leadership and our, and our defense leadership were able to get together and materially move forward the way we shared information to go after, uh, to go after the CT targets more effectively. Ambassador Lute mentioned earlier the, some of the transformation that's occurred in the NATO context um, with the establishment of kind of a, an intelligence czar or an assistant secretary general for intelligence to try to drive forward that, that um, intelligence support to operations in the NATO context. So I think these are just some examples of, in the real world, where the rubber meets the road, um, how we deal with those complexities. The partnerships uh, that our military relies upon to advance our national interest and our national security are critically important. Um, intelligence really underpins all of that. Um, it's a complicated um, portfolio to have to manage. Uh, it requires good faith by a, a lot of the operators who are working um, the problem sets on the ground, coupled with good faith in Washington to set the policy and, and um, uh, rule set framework around which we can do the sharing to, to, uh, to move forward more effectively. So I'll pause there. That's just a few thoughts from the military perspective and really look forward to the dialogue over questions. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, we'll move into our uh, questions and answers now, but I'd like to kick off uh, with a question of, of my own. Um, one of my favorite writers is uh, John Le Carre, and he says, uh, I've been, in one of his novels, he says, I've been asked to lie for the good of my country, but the problem is I don't know what the truth is. <laughs> Having said that for this panel, I figure this was appropriate. Is it possible? and then maintain an intelligence and security relationship with a country that is generally thought of as an adversary of the United States. Anybody want to tackle that initially? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is possible, but it's difficult. Um, and it becomes more difficult as uh, the political and di diplomatic relationships uh, become more difficult. So it trails that. But um, Lord Palmerston said, uh, there are no permanent allies, there are only permanent interests. Henry Kissinger put it a little more pointedly, he said, uh, and maybe with some overstatement, um, he said, uh, there are no friendly intelligence services, there are only the intelligence services of friendly countries. You can see where he's going with that. So all of these relationships are ones where, as David said, you're basically saying, what is our national interest? <coughs> Your political leaders help you define that. And what is their national interest? And where can we have those two things overlap, even when we are at the political level or diplomatic level uh, shouting at each other or at each other's throats? I think if you use that rule, you can do it. The other thing I'd put into this is David's point about trust. Even when you use that rule, uh, you then have to ask yourself, OK, we've isolated our interest and their interest. They converge. We're working together. Can we trust them to do what they've promised to do? And the only way you find that out is by trying. In other words, you put your hand in the operational fire, and you see what happens. If they deliver. Um, you've learned something. I can think of one example. I can't give the specific country where we, we knew that this country at an intelligence level at certain, on certain issues was working actively against us. But we could find within that service a group of people who understood the need to converge these interests and we, we got a lot of important work done with them. So, uh, yeah, I was going to give you my favorite Le Carre quote, too. Love but, to hear it, please, John. Well, it doesn't relate to this question so much. <laughs> but, it, but he's full of wisdom on this. He said that in, it's, it's in his Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, one of his characters says, intelligence agencies are not rogue agencies. They are the only true measure of a nation's subconscious. I could just add. Think about that. Add something to what 
John said, one of the things that we're <coughs> trained to do as intelligence professionals is to always evaluate the source. And I'd argue you should do that every day, whether you're reading the newspaper or you're watching, you're watching the television, what have you. But to always bear in mind, regardless of the closeness of the relationship with the liaison services, information may be provided, as we say, to influence as well as to inform. And to think about what's the motivation for sharing that information. Let me just add a, a, a footnote to the question in where, in my experience, the intelligence relationship has been been able to be a conduit to overcome, or at least manage in a better way, the conflict that's at the political level. In part because quite often these countries have longtime professionals in those positions that are prepared to not throw out the relationship for exp political expediency sake and are able to and desire to see it uh, prosper, at least in the areas of common interest. So it doesn't take away anything that either John or Leslie have said, but it does, I think, give you an example where because of the non-public nature of the relationship, it, it can overcome, at least for a period of time, mm -hmm. uh, that, those tensions. There's also, I was thinking about China, too, while you were um, posing that question. Let's look at North Korea for an example right now. Uh, and, and it's important when I say that they, you have to have a convergence of interests. Uh, the previous panel put a lot of emphasis on the importance of diplomacy, and I bet everyone on this panel would second that strongly. It's often the diplomats uh, who have to help that other country see that there's a convergence of interests, and then the intelligence people can come in and work in that crevice. But just take China for an example. We have an interest in North Korea not having nuclear weapons. The South Koreans have that interest with all of the, with due acknowledgement of some of the points Corey made about not getting out of step with your close ally. How do the Chinese think about this? Well, they want the Korean Peninsula to be generally like it is, divided. On the other hand, if the North Koreans get nuclear weapons, they're going to look to us even more, mm -hmm. the South Koreans and the Japanese and others, for protection. That means we'll be even more important in a region where China wants to be preeminent. Japan might be tempted to get their own. South Korea might be tempted to get their own. If diplomacy can make the Chinese see that interest they have and bring it out, it can lay the groundwork for co cooperation on other areas to move this problem forward. And I hope someone is trying to do that now. Marcel, any comments, thoughts on that? Just to add, from the, from the military perspective, I think we often find, as, as, the, as the previous panel flagged, the importance of military to military exchanges. And uh, in my observation, um, US military leaders are often very favorably disposed to looking at military to military um, communication channels and relationships as a way to lessen, lessen tensions, um, even with adversaries or uh, countries that are um, heavily um, uh, predisposed to have different interests than us. And a, an important subset of that is the defense intelligence analytic communities um, within our country and, and potentially those countries, where it is often the case that um, there are topics um, of mutual interest that can be explored together um, analytically, far below the, the political disputes that may be happening, that can serve to be a useful confidence-building measure. So in some ways, there are layers where you might have at the, at the political level um, strategic level, a complete inability um, to have that dialogue. Diplomatic channels can accomplish some of that. Civilian intelligence agencies can very quietly accomplish some of that. And the military um, defense intelligence communities can provide another tool in the toolbox as well. 
Very interesting. Uh, at this time, we'd like to take some questions from the audience. Uh, gentleman in the uh, blue jacket right up front here. Hi, Shane Walsh with Arena Growth Partners here in Austin. Uh, my question has to do with the idea that obviously intelligence has become maybe more so than at any other time of our history um, essential to our national security and the cooperation with other intelligence is equally essential. Mr. Shedd, your point earlier, um, the idea that other countries trust us. Um, contrast that with, ironically now, one of the greatest threats to our intelligence complex is domestic, um, where the idea that um, people who um, illegally share intelligence um, are somehow glorified or lionized. Um, add that to the concept that, you know, of, of absolute privacy, um, which has recently been established by Apple's stance toward being able to get into devices. Um, I guess my question is, how significant are those headwinds? Um, are, are they significant or are they not significant? The intelligence community just kind of figures out a way around it. Or, and if they, to the extent they are significant, what can be done? Um, because I don't see either one of those threats going away anytime soon. Anybody want to tackle that one? I'll just open on it. Uh, since you, you mentioned what I said. I think the, in the advent of cyber that Leslie talked about and has applied to, to financial markets and, and the financial sector, much more broadly, the cyber world has dramatically changed how both secrets are acquired and how secrets are protected. And there are some very real challenges within the intelligence community on how to build those partnerships in the in the cyber arena, in that the proverbial toolkit that are available to the partners may be very similar, if not identical, to the ones that we may be using. And the complexities of big data collection, also known as bulk collection, and that sort of thing has triggered, I think, some really new and challenging uh, aspects to intelligence that, as we see with Edward Snowden and what he did, uh, which was treachery as far as I'm concerned, he can be replicated with doing far more damage to our nation as an insider threat as well, and undermine that relationship to an already more complex series of partners if you exclusively look to the cyber ones and zeros relationships that you have in the digitized uh, world that we're in. So uh, maybe some ideas for the students here is to work on the whole ethics area of what you're referring to, which I think is, uh, is, is, uh, is a new area of hard work that needs to be done. How much do you collect, how much you retain, how much you share, and the tools associated with it, and the relationship then with your partners to bring it back to that in terms of the, the, the partnerships around the globe. And it may not surprise you, once again, if you tier it, the Commonwealth is the closest relationship, but there are capabilities at the second and third tier that are not dissimilar from what are available at, the, at tier one, if you will, of, of those relationships. Working through that is, is a tough, tough job and unfinished business as far as I'm concerned. Anybody else would like to add any comments to David's remarks? Just to add um, two points. Um, one, I think it was Sue Gordon, who's the, the, the brand new deputy director of national intelligence a couple weeks ago, who said um, in response to a question around uh, privacy and civil liberties and the uh, dialogue that's occurring in, in the American public around where, where to draw the line right there. She reminded the audience that, um, you know, government officials and intelligence leaders um, swear an oath when they take the job to protect and defend the Constitution, which at the end of the day is all about um, protecting the civil liberties and, and uh, values that uh, we fought our American Revolution over. So I think what that suggests is we, there is an imperative for intelligence leaders to continue to find a way to have a dialogue with the American public about the tools uh, of intelligence. And 
the sincerity with which those tools are deployed to uh, protect the nation and to protect those constitutional values. Um, and that dialogue is the kind of thing that the University of Texas, I think, can help, can help foster in the right way. The second point I'd make is um, one, one thing we have learned over the last uh, five to seven years with some of the uh, major disclosures um, of, of uh, data and, and techniques and our knowledge about um, how formidable a threat cyber can be in the hands of our adversaries is how imperative it is for the government and American industry and the American private sector um, to have a rich dialogue about the innovation that's necessary uh, to keep our comparative advantages over time. It's uh, particularly felt, uh, from my perspective, in the context of the military, um, where in, in looking at the threats that we face um, from high-end adversaries over the next 10 or 20 years, we worry a lot about the fragility of, of our strategic advantage and the need to refresh that um, with the best of, that American innovation can offer from, from our commercial sectors. But I think it's also very directly applicable in the intelligence capability and toolkit as well. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, over here, sir. Hello, uh, my name is Sergeant Ellison. I'm from uh, 36 ID G2. Uh, my question was in regards to intelligence sharing, we're talking a lot about it at the upper policy level, uh, but a lot of the products made and so on and so forth are happening at the analyst level. Could you foresee creating mechanisms that share, allow analysts from our partner nations or other intelligence uh, communities to share intelligence, analyst to analyst, to fuse the intelligence effort, and what would that look like? Well, we do that. Uh uh, sorry, to, to a degree, uh, I know I've been involved in a lot of that, where you basically uh, take a group of analysts to another country and you sit down and have a conference with them, not quite this large, but, but, but a small group of people around a table and you exchange views. Uh, I mean, it, it's not hard to imagine that um, uh, Japan would have some interest in what's going on in, in uh, South Korea. It's, it's not hard to imagine that uh, you know, Jordan would have some interest in what's going on in the region around it. And so there's ample, those are off the top of my head examples, so there's ample opportunities where you have a convergent of interest or an ally or a partner uh, to literally sit down and say, here's our point of view and what's your point of view. You find that uh, you can do that without revealing a lot of uh, highly classified information, partly drawing on open source, but also just saying, here's what we think, uh, based on everything we have, what do you think? This is interestingly a test uh, of how to start building the relationships. I've been in, involved in cases where we really wanted that relationship because we knew that other country had a lot of insight that we didn't have. And we'd go and give them more or less everything we had, and they would listen and write it down and wouldn't give us anything back. Well, we learned something from that, didn't we? About trust, about the, the state of the relationship. And then there are other instances, and of course the Commonwealth has been cited by a number of people as the preeminent case where uh, you can pretty much share it all and you get back what you're looking for, what, you're, what you need. The other thing that strikes me dealing with other intelligence services is uh, some have a global view there are a few, that have, a handful, that have really a global view, either from their current operations or from their history. And you can talk to them about almost anything and get value from it. And then others understand a region or a country or a neighborhood very deeply. And, and that's where your value comes with, with those types of services. So I'm not saying we do this exactly as we should, as much as we should, but there's a, there's a process there that, that is pursued. Yeah. I, I would only add, and Sergeant, thank you for your service and that, that table, thank you, uh, that, that technology is working in our favor for the kind of exchange that, uh, that you describe. At the Defense Intelligence Agency, when I left in, in January of 2015, we were already set up with secure video teleconferences with analysts in locations like uh, uh, South Korea and Japan and and, uh, and Mexico and other places where we had these very good exchanges 
analysis to analysis and the people behind that analysis, which I found really very productive. Why the currency, rather than getting on an aircraft and getting over there or vice versa and the approvals to do all that, was done in real time against either a crisis situation or periodically already scheduled reviews and done so through, uh, through video teleconferencing. There's also a tactical strategic issue here that's maybe part of where you're coming from, Sergeant, because I remember uh, when I was in Vietnam in the Army, this goes back uh, decades, of course, uh, as an Army intelligence officer, and I would read the material coming from the CIA in Washington, and I would say, that's not interesting to me. They're way up here. I ought to worry about what's behind that hill over there. And uh, never knowing that I would eventually be up here <laughs> writing that stuff. Uh, but I, I will say that the tactical experience really informed my work as, as a, a CIA officer. And, and that is a divide that exists less today than in the past because of the, uh, the last 15 years of war. Uh, it's less acute than it was, but there was a time when that divide was a real wall for that exchange. I don't think it is so much now. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Thank you, speakers, uh, for visiting Texas and coming down here and sharing your wisdom and your experience and for your service to the country. Uh, Josh Graham, a former uh, CIA officer, uh, I came back to Texas to dive into the uh, emerging technology field, the innovation arena here. And so my question is along those lines. Uh, what are the threats and the opportunities for emerging technologies like cryptocurrencies or AI uh, in our both fight and defense of the country? Thank you. Yeah. Anybody? Okay, I'll jump in. Um, I think uh, where, where computing is going in terms of um, quantum computing is not that far away, and I don't think then that that side of development is linear, but rather it's a, no pun intended, quantum leap uh, ahead that uh, is, and as your question inferred, the, the commercialization of technology is dramatically different from the, the period of time when we certainly started our careers to where it is today, and the the, the price point of that technology and availability to uh, a, a low-end user from a financial standpoint is far greater in terms of, of, of that application. I think there are threats from that. So if you take the drone world and all its applications for good and obviously for nefarious reasons, those are challenges that are new. You mentioned artificial intelligence with AI. AI and machine learning, I think, are, um, uh, it's not a perfect solution by any means now, but I think it's a world that we're going into in which you can, uh, you can develop new information. There will be real ethics challenges when you start asking the question about how did you make a decision that was cooked up out of a black box? And you don't know what that was. And so there'll be, questions about that that the adversary won't have to go through, obviously, in asking those questions. They'll just apply it. And so I think it's, it's back to the earlier question on the cyber domains and as it relates to that, opportunities, but definitely some real threats at a really low cost level. I would say those, I put those in the category of that. And finally, I would say the internet in terms of the ability of, of individuals who wish to do us harm being able to find and, and, and create that, that ability because of knowledge that's, that's derived from, from the internet. And of course, I include the dark net in terms of the capabilities of drawing knowledge there. Actually, and that question, I think, Rip, you put your finger on really maybe the central dilemma for intelligence today, beyond the classic dilemmas of determining intentions and managing human and so forth. Because in intelligence, there's one iron rule when it comes to technology. You always have to be ahead of where the technology is commonly available, because the adversary has all of that. So yours always has to be one better 
or you're on at best a level playing field. So that puts a real emphasis on some basic research on the technology side in the intelligence world. It's why, for example, uh, with some foresight, we created a, a, a InQtel, which is a, a venture capitalist firm we created around the year 2000, to exploit the fact that much modern technology is being invented in garages and in Silicon Valley, uh, not always in a major defense contractor, which they still do great work, but that's, there's, there's more to life than there was in the day when we could invent with the Air Force and a major contractor, the U-2, or someone could say, what if we took photographs from space and we could create space satellites and it would take a long time and we would get them to work and it revolutionized the business. Well, today all of that's happening at warp speed. So uh, it really is a central challenge for intelligence is how to exploit what's there. There's a, there's a you know, it's the other, the usual yin and yang with intelligence with say uh, internet of things. Okay, we have a vulnerability. We also have an opportunity. Same with artificial intelligence. Same with robotics. So I think uh, this is the area where our, our discipline has to really do some adventurous thinking now. We're doing well. Uh, the the uh, CI director, uh, the previous CI director created something called the Digital Directorate. It's a fifth directorate at CIA. The intention of which is to pull together the digital world in that agency and to reach out to parts of the uh, American community where that where innovation is occurring on those areas. Now that's a step forward, but um, I'll stop there. You know, one of the, I think, unintended consequences of the leaks that we've seen and the increased awareness and negative perception of U.S. capabilities um, is an increased desire for anonymity. So you end up with cryptocurrencies. You end up with um, actors moving to end-to-end -end encryption, uh, making it more difficult for uh, the intelligence community and law enforcement to understand what bad actors want to do. And looking at cryptocurrencies, right now, you know, looking at them through the lens of sanctions, following money, um, I mean, let's face it, you go to a cryptocurrency for a um, couple reasons. The largest one being is you want to hide what you're doing, and a lot of it is trafficking in drugs and child pornography um, and things like that. Don't necessarily see it now as a primary way of moving money for a lot of actors that the government follows, but that doesn't mean that can't happen in the future, and that will make it increasingly difficult to support U.S. policy efforts, such as sanctions, which have proven effective in many cases. In the military context, if I could just add, Fred, um, one of the big themes that I think encompasses a lot of the innovation dilemma that uh, many people are, are thinking through is, um, is, is really the question of, um, of the scale of operations. And the, when you combine what, as General Welsh mentioned earlier today, something like full motion video feeds as one source of data coming in that have gone from 6,000 hours a month to 2 million hours a month. And then you replicate that across all of the data feeds <laughs> that come in. Some of it's data feeds, some of it's classified intelligence uh, collection. Um, all of these in the past have tended to operate in, in silos or stovepipes with the analyst um, being trained to combine it all together. And we have now gotten pretty good about automating uh, some of that to occur <laughs> in support of one or two or a small number of counterterrorism operations. But for the military, um, that intelligence support needs to be something that can scale to fight potentially a major, major theater contingency if we ever were called upon to do so um, and handle these large volumes of, of data and new sources of data coming in. So, the big theme around uh, innovation that I think you hear from the defense intelligence leadership and from the Pentagon um, really is around this problem of, of, of that volume and that precision applicability of information to achieve uh, military effects. 
um, and it's driving the military to, to be seeking out solutions in uh, not only in artificial intelligence, but in um, automation and coherent change detection um, and human machine teaming um, as, as some major innovation efforts. And then finally, to look at ways to integrate across these various uh, traditionally independent sources of inf information. So um, as more satellite uh, architectures come online, many of which are commercially driven, how do you combine that information with the airborne um, intelligence collection layer um, and information that is being generated from the Internet of Things and sensor networks across, across the globe? Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for perhaps one or two more. We have a uh, hard stop at 11.45, just so everybody knows. So, uh, yes, ma'am, right here. Behind you. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Galia Popov. I'm studying international relations here at UT. Um, I had a question about cybersecurity. So you said that the health of the financial sector is vital to our national security. But you also talked a lot about the importance of secrecy and keeping information from coming out into the public sphere. So I was wondering, to what extent can the intelligence community really cooperate with the private sector when it comes to protecting them and their interests? Can you cooperate? Um, and if not, how do you deal with that difficulty? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, and I don't necessarily think that the statements that I made are um, necessarily contradictory. I still think it's important to have secrecy, and, and um, particularly when you're talking about protecting the lives of human beings who are risking their lives to provide you with information, or you're talking about sensitive technical capabilities that um, you, could, you could risk losing. Um, you know, if you take a page from what the um, intelligence community has done with the defense industrial base, they've been able to find a way to share information because let's face it, foreign countries, foreign militaries really want to understand what kind of weapons or capabilities is the US developing. I think that sharing information with the financial sector, with any sector, let me put it that way, with any sector that involves US person's information is going to be a bigger challenge because you're going to have to have privacy concerns there. Um, you're going to have concerns within the financial sector about um, there's still an element of um, I not only need to protect my customer, but I need to protect my reputational standing. And you need to consider do they want it to be known, how widely do they want it to be known that they've come under a significant um, cyber attack. That's one challenge. Another challenge is going to be, so some of the information, I think some of the information you could share would be um, information that the sector might already have. You know, what is the vector of, of attack? Or, or what are the tech, tech, tactics, techniques, and procedures, the TTPs, that an actor is using? They might know that already. So how do you make it distinct? And I think if you make it distinct, you're talking about sharing classified information. In the defense industrial sector, you always had people who had clearances. You had facilities where they were capable of handling classified information. You don't have that necessarily with the financial sector right now. And a lot of times we found at Treasury that when you got somebody cleared um, in order to share some information, they quickly moved on to another job. And we can get into a whole other conversation about how long it takes to get a security clearance. And, um, and how intrusive it can be, and, and does someone from the sector really want to do that? So you brought up a good point. I, I think the bigger hurdles are just it's a brand new thing, and it's something that the sector is going to be wary of, but I think it's something that we've got to proceed on, because I think the intelligence community can bring a unique perspective that they don't have. I, I will only add that your question points, though, to a tension in the system that in a post 9-11 environment of 16 years ago and forward, the driver of information sharing to how we had to change the way we do business inside the intelligence community and sharing information and the, the risk associated with that sharing. And so my, my concern is that the pendulum swing in a post Snowden environment is moving to increasing demands for compartmentation rather than sharing. 
and, and that it's intention, and there is no perfect solution to it. Uh, but, but part of it is, I think, the insider threat has driven uh, the community into to greater compartmentation and less sharing than I think was the original intent of both the 9-11 Commission and then the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004 by way of driving how the, the intelligence community had to change. Thank you. We have about five more minutes. Marcel, John, any more comments on that question? I would just say this is a work in progress. Your, your question is really good. It's a work in progress. Um, Homeland Security and other parts of the federal government are trying to bridge that gap with private industry. It's a work in progress. Uh, private industry is increasingly aware of the cybersecurity threat, taking their own protective measures with uh, une uneven results, as we see often in the paper, Equifax and so forth. Um, there's, a, uh, there's, there's a danger here if we don't get this problem solved, and that is that private industry will not only take on the defensive role against attack, they will be tempted to go on the offense as well. And that would be a really an awkward thing if we had, if we had cyber warriors all over the United States in both the private sector and the, and the public sector. So it's an urgent problem, and I'd say we've made progress on it, but it's still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much. 